You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. Well, this is your short, quick episode with the five in five interviews. And I stress again, this is not normally my style. You'll find interviews with all of these authors, full, long ones, earlier on, probably last year, I think. But these are just some short, sharp questions, five in five, for them to answer, just to remind you about these brilliant books that I've loved and enjoyed over the time. So which books are we including today? We're including The Museum of Ordinary People, written by Mike Gale. Then we've got Agent 17 by John Brownlow. And finally, Mother's Boy by Patrick Gale. So let's get started straight away and hear from Mike Gale about The Museum of Ordinary People. Mike Gale, author of, well, whose latest wonderful book is The Museum of Ordinary People. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello there. Thank you. You have your five questions in five minutes, if you are ready. Okay, I'll I'll try my best to keep it into that time. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry, there's no stop watch, you're fine. Um, The first one, simple one, can you describe your book in less than a minute? Yes, I can. The Museum of Ordinary People is a book about uh, Jess Baxter, and she's a little bit lost. She lost her mum a year earlier. Yeah, she's a little bit lost, really, and she has got this set of encyclopedias that she got from her mum's house when she when she was clearing the home, when she's clearing the house, and she doesn't know what to do with them, and she's about to throw them out when a friend tells her about the Museum of Ordinary People, which is a, a kind of unofficial museum at the back of a house clearing company in Peckham. And when Jess goes there, it changes her life, and she decides to try and turn it into... A, an actual proper museum and in the process lots of other mysteries are unlocked to do with the museum not just with the museum but also to do with Jess herself. Who was your favourite smaller character? It can't be the main ones but someone that you really enjoyed writing in the book. Oh I think it would have to be I, I like Paul and Deck. <laughs> they are they, so Paul and Deck work in the house clearance company and they're quite straight talking and they don't really know much about museums but they end up getting involved in the museums and they end up getting most of the really good lines because um you know people who are straight talking tend to get the best lines (laughs) because you know it's kind of piercing that uh, everybody's sort of um not pomposity but but sort of they, they 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 are straight talking so you know they say they say what they yeah. mean and they mean what they think. They, they so don't wear a mask. You can have a lot of fun with, that's it, you, you can have a lot of fun with those sort of characters. Your next question, what three feelings do you want people to feel while reading this book? Oh, that's good. Um, uh, I, 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 I might need a little bit of help. Yeah. It's, it's, I suppose it's, 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 being, it's being thoughtful. Thoughtful, is that a feeling? Y- yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think I, I want. It's it's, it's probably. I, I should be better at this <laughs> one, using words, shouldn't I? But um, I suppose I want people to be provoked. Yes. And to and to think, and to, I suppose, have empathy. Yeah. With the the characters in the the situations. Yeah, and I would add to that sort of fulfilled the book when you feel fulfilled when you yes, finish yeah. the book, and yes, definitely, and you yes, learn yeah. as you're reading it about all sorts of things. But yeah, great. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been asked this question before, Mike. So we'll see. What food and drink did you consume when you were writing this particular book? <laughs> I have never been asked this question. Bizarrely, the, the first answer that kind of came to me is, so I tend to write between 8 and between eight and 1 o'clock. And I currently, probably for the time that I've been, I was writing the Museum of Ordinary People, and it's been several years, I've been quite into Marks and Spencer shortbread biscuits. And <laughs> I probably, at 10.30, I take a break. And I will help myself to a cup of tea and a, a, a little bit of a biscuit. It's not a good thing. It's not something that I'm proud of. Yeah, it's probably, it was a book built on shortbread. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
perfect. Is that the variety pack that you get? Uh, no, no, it is. It's it's the, the, it's the standard. small standard pack, and the the thing about them is they're really um, they're really quite they they feel quite substantial when you bite into them. They're very difficult to just have the one. He admits, sadly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, the, a book fueled by shortbread, absolutely perfect. Your last question: What's been the most memorable moment in your writing career so far? I mean, again, it's a difficult one. I could choose the. Uh, I remember the the first time that I got proof in the post. So, basically, a proof is they get your manuscripts. So, when you write your manuscripts, it's just you know it's printed out on A4 sheets of paper. And they need to get people to read it, so they need to send it out to bookshops and to journalists and things like that to kind of get early reviews in. And so they take your manuscript, they'll shrink it down, and they'll they'll bind it into an actual book. And sometimes, um, especially with really early proofs, they don't even have a particular cover. It, it will sort of have your name and the title, but it just be blank. And I remember getting the proof in the post of my legendary girlfriend. And in the post and I remember opening the envelope and just thinking to myself you know I remember going to my bookshelf and clearing a space between Thomas Hardy and, and um, Emily Bronte and just slipping in My Legendary Girlfriend by Mike Gale and I just thought to myself you know if, if it, even if it all falls apart after this I'll always have this and it was just a really lovely moment to kind of have your own book on your own shelf. So, yeah, oh, that was that's a special one. Wonderful. I, I love the idea of that. That's great. Well, it, great, great memory and a, a great book. Mike Gale, author of The Museum of Ordinary People. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Excellent stuff. And now we're going to hear from John Brownlow about Agent 17. My goodness, I love this book. And there is Agent 18 coming out, I believe, in August. Can't wait for that. So let's hear from John. So John Brownlow, author of 17, welcome back to the podcast. Well, I'm glad you had me. I didn't screw you up so badly last time that you wouldn't have me back. <laughs> Not at all. Your first question, you've got five questions oh in five minutes. Your first one, can you describe your book for us in 30 seconds? Uh, it's the story of a hit man who's the 17th in a long dynasty of hit people or spies. Uh, it's going all the way back to the Romanovs and the Russian Revolution. Each one is the best hit man of their era, or woman of their era, it's as it's a uh, how can I put it? It's like a price, like being told that you're salesman of the year, Eastern region, except for <laughs> hitmen. And if you want to become number eighteen, the best way of doing it is to kill number seventeen. And so it's a sort of competitive, greasy pole that one must climb up to get above the other. Um, so really, that's the universe that it takes place in. It's actually modelled after the Hollywood star system. So everyone has an agent and, you know, gets star billing and so on and so oh. forth. Um, uh, so it, it, it's, a fu it's, it's, uh, it's meant to put a little bit of fun back into the Hitman novel and also turn it on its head slightly. Excellent. Your second question, who was your favourite character to write? But it has to be a minor character, not one of the major ones. Oh, that's Barb by a thousand <laughs> times. Barb <laughs> is one of my... And uh, you think that she's a minor character, but she isn't at all. She's the... Uh, she's the she, and she's going to... In the next book, she turns up again. I, in, the, in the next book, I actually tried to kill her and the editor objected so strongly that we had to keep her alive. <laughs> So Barb's back. Barb, so, I could yeah. write movies about mm -hmm. Barb. If I could write movies about all of the handler, I could. They all, all of the minor characters mm -hmm. have lives, and one of the pleasures doing of um, being it being a series is that they may well have much bigger parts in other books. Mm, my eyebrows go very high when when you say that. Okay, your third question: What three feelings do you want us to feel as we are reading your book? Number one, pleasure. Uh, number two, excitement. Number three, I want you to identify with the character with with a character. I want you to I want you to feel that there is a character in there who's connection. like yes, connection with the yeah. character. Yeah, well, that those are much better than mine. I was I came up with uh, uh, enjoyment. I did enjoy it, but fear. I, I was concerned and committed. I was fully committed to finding out. Oh, that's what good. Happened to those. Yeah, I think. I mean, just to just to expand on that slightly. To expand over my minute, I think the 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 pleasure the the idea that 
reading books should be pleasurable and enjoyable, people don't pay enough attention to that. Uh, you know, there's a there's people get sniffy about commercial fiction. Mm. but to me the whole point of it is that you know is that people's lives need to be if you if you're writing a book why on earth would you want to write a book that made people feel worse at the end of it what would be the point of that why are you doing that to people like mm. you know if i'm writing a book i want someone to read it and feel that they 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 made them feel better not worse mm. so that's sorry that preaching preaching is no over. that's that's a fair point next question i don't know if you've been asked this one before but what food and drink did you particularly consume when you were writing the main part of this book <laughs> no i have not been asked that before beer and coffee is the <laughs> <laughs> black coffee or is that no no like, like a like a i like a good uh either aeropress or a mocha pot like a good strong cup of coffee like an americano white american very strong white americano and uh and some very good craft beer excellent so there's no food consumed while writing I do, this. almost none liquid no, only right. <laughs> excellent drink your carbs that's the what i say <laughs> yeah <laughs> Your last question. What's been the most memorable moment so far in your writing career? Well, there, <laughs> I, there are a lot of memorable moments. They're not all good moments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They're, 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 you know, you can't work in Hollywood for very long before just the most extraordinary things happen. Probably the most memorable. Hollywood is, if nothing, a cliche of itself. So I wrote, the, I wrote, a, I wrote an, adapt, uh, an adaptation of a book called Captain Blood, which was made to, into a pirate film but with Errol Flynn in the 1950s or 40s. And I wrote a modern day adaptation of it, which is sort of in the, the vein of, you know, Captain Jack Sparrow and all of that stuff. Mm. Anyway, so the, I wrote it and it was quite good. People liked it. And then one day I was in Warner Brothers having a meeting and the executive on the, on the pirate movie fat, saw me in a corridor and he went, John, John, come in here, come in come here. And he, he beckoned me into a room. And there, were, there was a big question about whether this pirate movie would get made or not. Anyway, he beckoned me into the room, and it was a darkened room. It was a screening room. And he said, sit down, sit down. I've got to show you something. And I, I had no idea what was going on. I wasn't even there to talk to him about this. And uh, he, this was in the days of DVDs, and he stuck a DVD into a DVD player. He said, don't say anything, just watch. I'd heard that he'd sent the, the, the script to these pair of Australian directors who were very hot at the time. And anyway, there was a, a fanfare of music. And two pirate ships sailed in, one from either side of the screen, except they weren't pirate ships. They were spaceships shaped like pirate ships. And they started firing lasers at each other, going, boo, 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 boo. I sat there completely um, gobsmacked. And at the end of it, he pressed the pause button and he went, so in space, what do you think? <laughs> and I went and he said can you do it and I thought for a moment I went of course I can like how much are you going to pay me and that, <laughs> and I did I, I put it in space I, four weeks later it was in space so that was honestly the most the most memorable moment of my writing career so far <laughs> It pays to just say yes when they say can you do this I of course you, you have to right yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, wow. and that, so that was that's number one. Number close behind it is the day uh, when Ollie sent the book seventeen out, and I knew nothing about the publication process or anything like that. And he said, oh, you know, it could be weeks before we get a response. And then he called me like first thing on Monday morning and said, we've got two offers on the book, and that was that was an amazing moment. And uh, so yeah, that, that one of the things that is, I'm boring you, but I'm going to bore you a little bit longer. I went to Harrogate, the Literary Festival, uh, in July. And one of the really interesting things about that meeting, lots of other authors, was that whoever they are, what you know, what, whatever nationality or race or what genre they're writing in, they pretty much all have the same story, which is that at one point they decided, based on nothing at all, that they were go and knowing, not knowing whether they could do it, they decided to write a novel. And then they sent it off to an agent or, you know, whatever. And to their surprise, they got published. And they everybody had the same reaction of this sort of being like a gift from, 
you know, from the universe that you could do this. So there was the sort of humility of people w was fantastic. And there was this, uh, but also the kind of self-belief of just sitting down and damn writing the damn thing, whether you knew you could do it or not. Um, that it's really interesting. You talk to any author and they have that story. Was that your first experience at Harrogate? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I had no idea. I had no, no idea what it was going to be like. It's off the wall, that place. <laughs> are oh you going God. back next year? or are you... well, You'd try to keep me away, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. Well, John Brownlow, whose book 17 is out now. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And for the final book today is Mother's Boy by Patrick Gale. Again, another book that I really enjoyed, really moved me. And let's hear from Patrick. So Patrick Gale author of Mother's Boy. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much, Philippa. Well, you have your five questions in five minutes, if you are ready. I am. <laughs> <laughs> First question, can you describe your book in about 30 seconds? It is a potted version of the life story of the great Cornish poet Charles Causley and his laundress mother, Laura. Wow, that's summarising it in very few seconds. That's, ex that's excellent. <laughs> well, you could throw in two world wars if you like. <laughs> yes, we'll allow that. I'm interested who your favourite main character was, well, I may know, and who your favourite very minor character was in the book. Oh, OK. I think, I think my favourite main character is Charles mm. because he's prickly and difficult and I love a challenge. He's a, he's a hedgehog of a boy. Hard to get close to. And my favourite minor character is Charles's great love, who is a, a fellow sailor in the Navy called Cushti, who's a Liverpudlian, a kind of gentle giant, um, who saves Charles's life. Right. Uh, the next question, what three things do you want us to feel as we're reading this book? Oh, I want you to feel fear, hope and curiosity actually because one of the things I love is when people read this book not knowing Charles's work and are left curious to find out more. Those are much better than mine that I came up with. Mine were um, I was committed to the story. I, I, yeah. Once I started I needed to keep reading. I felt a warmth to the characters and I was surprised. You kept surprised. Oh, good. Me. I'm so glad. I'm so, so glad. What are you doing? But there, there we go. The next question is one you may not have been asked that much. What food and drink did you consume the most when you were writing this particular book? <laughs> oh, it's always the same with me. Biscuits. I eat far too many <laughs> biscuits. <laughs> what sort of biscuits? Let's get down to detail. Um, well, I quite often, I have to say, they are often biscuits I've made myself. And I, um, oh. I am particularly addicted to the work of a very fine Australian chef called Dan Leppard, who lives in London now. And he has a recipe for ginger and tamarind cookies, which are divine. And it's impossible to eat just three. So uh, I recommend Googling Dan Leppard ginger and tamarind cookies. <laughs> well, I, I know it sounds positively healthy to me. <laughs> oh, they're not. They have an like awful lot of balance. sugar and butter in them, but they're delicious. <laughs> they're chewy and they're peppery. They're really good. And are you drinking cups of tea while you're doing that? I am. I, I developed a very expensive tea habit when I toured China, um, which is for a white tea called Silver Needle which costs some silly amount of money, but it is utterly delicious. And it has a very special, it's very good for you. And it has a very special property, which is that it never, ever goes off in the jar. You can make a pot of it and it will, even though it's gone cold, it won't get stewed. It carries on tasting fresh. Amazing stuff. So I, I often have a pot of silver needle tea beside me with the ginger cookies. There's going to be a lot of Googling going on after, <laughs> after this interview, Patrick. Um, your final question, what's been the most memorable moment in your writing career so far? Oh, gosh, there have been so many. I think probably, though, it was being on the Richard and Judy show with my novel <laughs> Notes from an Exhibition. Because although I wasn't on the show, I mean, they, they filmed an interview with me. But overnight, that got me about 250,000 readers I didn't have before. So that's a life change, definitely a life changing moment. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah. The... It, it was the equivalent of winning, winning a big prize. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm eternally grateful to them. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and uh, we're eternally grateful for you writing Mother's Boy. Patrick Gale, thank you so much. Thank you, Philippa.
Gosh, it's been a bit of a longer episode today, hasn't it? But never mind. We've had fun. Three different books, I think you'll find. Three very different books. But hopefully you've enjoyed that. As I say, if you don't like the short style, don't worry. There are longer interviews with all of the authors. Just look back in the history of the episodes. You'll find them there. So first of all, we had Mike Gale talking about the Museum of Ordinary People. Then John Brownlow talking about Agent 17. And finally, Patrick Gale talking about Mother's Boy. Those are your three books today. I'll be back with a normal episode. So if I can call anything I ever do normal on Monday. So just look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon. <laughs>